Good morning, um, everybody. I'm Claire de la Calle, for a urology resident at UCSF. Dr. George, thank you so much for being here today uh, for presenting focal therapy for prostate cancer. Um, welcome. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for the whole UCSF, UCSF team for putting this together and really spearheading it. Um, it really speaks to kind of um, uh, the initiative and also uh, I've been really impressed by, um, by the engagement in these different uh, educational activities. And it seems like this has really led uh, and it seems like there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of other lecture series that are coming online as well. So I'm gonna get started um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about focal therapy for, for prostate cancer. So the objectives today are going to be to understand what the rationale is for focal therapy. Um, to understand how would we choose uh, an appropriate man for focal therapy, uh, take a look at some of the existing focal therapy treatment modalities, uh, and also review some of the outcomes from larger series. Now, we'll start with the guidelines. Um, so the AUA Astro SUO uh, kind of consensus guideline from 2017 um, says that for high-risk prostate cancer, it is not recommended outside of a clinical trial. For low and intermediate risk prostate cancer, it's not the standard of care as com uh, given that comparative evidence is lacking. Maybe a little bit better, but not really. Um, there's really a lack of robust evidence for efficacy. Um, and specifically regarding high intensity focused ultrasound ablation, it is not explicitly approved for the treatment of prostate cancer. It is approved for uh, prostate tissue ablation. Uh, the FDA's guidance to that was that you don't approve a scalpel uh, to cut out cancer, you, uh, you approve it to cut out tissue. Um, and that specifically, again, for high food, that the tumor location can influence the outcome. So specifically in, uh, in high food cases where you spare a portion of the apex, anywhere from three to five millimeters, um, uh, that may result in um, residual disease. Uh, or alternatively, if it's an anterior tumor, um, you may have less deposition of energy. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and then finally is that prostate cancer is, is multifocal and um, treating only a focus of cancer uh, may not be curative. So what, how are these recommendations made? They're basic, essentially made based on expert, uh, expert opinion. Um, for the tumor location, uh, this is a, a level of evidence is C, which is essentially a consensus ex expert statement or um, uh, small series. Uh, ultimately, what this is showing us, and uh, these are all true statements, is that the amount of evidence in this space is, is lacking. Now, this was done in 2017. If I show you the more uh, updated guidelines, such as the EAU Prostate Cancer Guideline, which was recently released, they also say that you should only offer it within the context of a clinical trial or a, or a well-designed prospective cohort. Um, and then the NCCN prostate cancer guidelines, again, they don't recommend it as routine primary therapy uh, because of a lack, lack of long-term com comparative data. So here on, here on out, when I'm, what, what, what it's important for, uh, especially for trainees to understand is that this is not routine clinical, this is not part of the standard of care. Um, and it is, it is currently, uh, we're building the evidence data, the evidence base to support its, uh, support its treatment. So what's the rationale for focal therapy? There are, in 2020, there's going to be almost 191,000 new prostate cancer cases that will be diagnosed. Still approximately 30% of these represent low-risk cancers, um, but prostate cancer is still a leading cause of cancer death. 33,000 men will die from prostate cancer. Now, the vast majority of men, at least within the intermediate and, and high-risk groups, uh, will receive definitive treatment, and they will experience treatment-related related side effects. So the goal is to be able to avoid overtreatment, but also avoid undertreatment. Um, but patients are currently really faced with dichotomous treatment. They either have whole gland treatment or active surveillance, which is, um, though it is active and patients are being surveyed, uh, there is a small window in which um, there can be an increased risk of uh, either clinical, lo either local progression or, or distant metastasis. Um, the goal is ultimately treatment of the index lesion. Um, there's a difference in terms of how we conceptualize uh, treatment in focal therapy. It's uh, 
where traditionally cure is the ultimate goal with, with, um, with definitive treatments, um, even though it's still the goal with, uh, with focal therapy, when we think about it reasonably, the real goals are to prevent progression and to de delay definitive treatment, which, which are you know, potentially uh, relevant endpoints. And also the thought is to pr prioritize quality of life, um, especially in cancers which are less likely to benefit from um, uh, definitive treatments. So with any tr novel treatment, uh, it's essentially an evolution. So if we take, for example, uh, mastectomy, uh, Halstead radical mastectomy included uh, removal of all breast tissue, removal of the pectoralis major and minor, resection of the, of the serratus muscles, um, and had pretty uh, significant side effects. It was a disfiguring procedure. Um, the, lymph no the lymph node dissection could cause uh, lymphedema, um, and that was modified. Uh, it moved towards the modified ra radical mastectomy, which allowed for preservation of muscle. And then more recently, we're seeing uh, even less invasive approaches with uh, lumpectomy and radiation. And so the, the concept of, of organ sparing treatments is, is not new, um, especially in urology. If we look at, uh, if we look at um, uh, um, partial nephrectomy, um, initially radical nephrectomy was the standard of care and slowly uh, as the evidence base grew, that partial nephrectomy is now the standard of care if, uh, if it's feasible. Now, I took this slide uh, actually from, uh, from somebody who posted this on Twitter. I believe that it was from Dr. Kamatin uh, who presented at the meeting in 2016. Uh, it's just to give some perspective on prostate cancer versus other cancers uh, within urology that we actually uh, uh, take an organ sparing approach to. So if we look at high-grade T1, um, it has essentially the same disease-specific survival as some, uh, of some of the most aggressive prostate cancers that we, that we encounter. However, with high-grade T1, we, we are comfortable pursuing um, an organ-sparing approach with resection, restaging TURBT, uh, uh, giving intravesical treatments and surveillance. Um, prostate cancer focal therapy is not, is not so much different uh, within a, a, a cancer that is much less aggressive. So why, are we, why is focal therapy only now uh, becoming, uh, coming to the forefront? And it's predominantly because prostate MRI has been able to change the way in which we identify prostate cancers, localize prostate cancer so that we know where they are and we can set the, the margins or, or templates for ablation, and enable to better risk stratify cancers. So we have better local staging for high-risk features such as extra tension, seminal vesicle invasion, and disease volume. So what's the current paradigm? So if we take the, the kind of historic, and this is changing, um, but you have a clinical suspicion for prostate cancer, you undergo a 12 core biopsy. Um, and ultimately, if you diagnose prostate cancer, you're shuttled into surveillance or you're shuttled into whole gland treatment. Now, more recently, we've started to use MRI in all stages of diagnosis and follow-up. So specifically, if we look at whether, where it's most relevant to the role of focal therapy, uh, MRI can identify potential candidates for focal therapy. Once they're treated, they'll be followed with essentially with active surveillance, um, with imaging being uh, a cornerstone of that. So what, what can multi-parametric MRI help us with? It can uh, help us identify those clinically significant cancers because those tend to be the ones that are more visible. Um, it can help us localize lesions, like I mentioned before, in terms of where in the gland they are, um, how close they are to vital structures, such as the uh, apex and the, and the membranous urethra, um, close to the nerve bundle, bladder neck, urethra. Um, help us localize where within the prostate they are, assess the volume of disease, and we do know that MRI underestimates the volume of disease, um, and helps us risk stratify, as I mentioned before. Now, not all MRI is created equal. I actually love these top two images because uh, these were actually provided uh, by Dr. Art Rastenhat, who's now at Lenox Hill. Um, it, it really shows you the difference in quality that you can get from an MRI. So when you're going to select a patient, you need to have a good tool in order to map the prostate. The top two images are the same prostate. The bottom two images are the same, uh, are, the same uh, are a different prostate, but, they're, they're, uh, but they are the um, uh, DWI and T2-weighted imaging for the same prostate. And then the top image, specifically within the transition zone, um, which is that organized chaos, you can really see the amount of 
um, granularity that you can have in terms of making a determination if there's more cases of disease or not. So how do we select a patient? Um, you could potentially, if the MRI is positive, do a targeted biopsy and a, um, and a, uh, a standard 12-core biopsy. Uh, the most stringent criteria would be a template mapping biopsy, which is essentially a, a saturation biopsy where the prostate is sampled every five millimeters. Um, and then what do you do in patients who don't have any visible lesions? Uh, potentially either a template mapping biopsy or is a 12-core biopsy uh, in a patient with a negative MRI sufficient? I'm not ab absolutely sure that it is. It's essentially trying to find where Waldo is. And if you look here, this is where he is in this, uh, um, in this picture, if you're looking. So what's the ideal patient? The ideal patient is going to be a patient who has unifocal disease, and that only occurs in about... Um, or unifocal or unilateral only occurs in about 20% of patients. They need to have clinically significant disease, um, and that can be defined by either high volume or the presence of any pattern four. It needs to be isolated from vital structures, um, like the uh, uh, urethral sphincter, um, ideally from the neurovascular bundle, from bladder neck, from urethra. It needs to be MRI visible so that we know how much to treat, otherwise we're just treating the template. Um, and you want there to be the absence of high-risk features. So you don't want there to be a gross extracapsular extension or suspicion for seminal uh, vascular involvement. Now, the role of bio, genomic biomarkers, it's, been, it's helped us risk stratify um, um, intermediate risk prostate cancers. It really hasn't been explored well in the focal therapy space. There was a recent uh, consensus meeting to help define uh, define its role. However, it's still um, it's still very uh, early days. So, what are the challenges with patient selection? Um, patients are hetero but prostate cancers are heterogeneous. Patients are heterogeneous in that there are multiple risk factors that determine what we're going to, uh, how we think about a patient, their their uh, family history, um, their race. Uh, uh, death from prostate cancer uh, within first degree relatives, uh, genomic, um, f um, genomic uh, scores. Um, it's prostate cancer is multifocal, as we, as we know. And uh, it really, the likelihood that we would be able to identify all, even my microscopic foresight of prostate cancer on MRI and biopsy is, is low. So the question is, is that do we treat what's clinically significant versus not? And what does that mean? Is that the largest lesion? Uh, is that the greatest, uh, um, is that the greatest Gleason score? Um, or is it all of those prostate cancers that have the pattern four? As we know, Gleason pattern six is unlikely to metastasize or does not metastasize outside of the prostate. So we find these cancers with fusion biopsy. I'm not gonna go too much into that because it's uh, pretty routine as part of first additive care among many centers now. But here we can overlie the MRI with the ultrasound, identify a target and put a needle right through it. It also gives us the opportunity for patients who we know uh, a priori they're considering focal therapy that we can map the margins uh, and take ad additional calls around the specific lesion on MRI. So when patients are diagnosed with prostate cancer, they start to face a, a number of different treatment options. And sometimes these treatment options can be uh, overwhelming, even for uh, practitioners, uh, there are so many different treatment options that are out there that it can be uh, that it can be difficult to counsel a patient when they ask you about each individual one. I'll have to I'll, I'll hope to provide some clarity specifically on focal therapy. So, what is focal therapy? Uh, really, it is to treat the significant cancer only. Um, it's and really you want to leave the normal prostate behind. The more prostate that you treat. Uh, the greater compromise you'll see in functional outcomes. However, the more prostate that you treat, also uh, potentially the greater oncologic benefit that you'll get. So if we look at true focal therapy of a lesion, um, it's, it's the treatment of, a, of the lesion that's MR visible plus, an, uh, plus a, uh, a margin. Now this margin is up for debate. Some people use five millimeters. There have been studies which have shown nine millimeters may be the optimal margin or even up to 11 millimeters. Now, when you take about approximately a one centimeter margin in any lesion, um, it almost always becomes at least a, a quadrant ablation. So what are the advantages of focal therapy? So one of the advantages, uh, as I talked about, is that um, there is the concept of cancer control versus, versus cure. Now, all men 
may not re be required to be cured from their prostate cancer, but rather their cancer needs to be controlled so it, they don't develop metastatic disease, so they don't develop the sequelae or the side effects of treatment of metastatic disease, and so that they don't die from their prostate cancer. Now that is a, a, a much more achievable outcome and, and potentially achievable with, uh, with vocal therapy in some of the cases. It allows us to delay or avoid whole gland treatment in a number of men, very similar to how we employ uh, active surveillance. Um, we understand that in Gleason 6 prostate cancer, surveillance is an a, is a, is a effective and safe strategy. Um, the goal with uh, focal therapy would be able to treat what we see at the time and we follow them on surveillance. If they develop new areas of clinically significant disease, either they can uh, continue with a repeat uh, ablation or alternatively, they may need to be transitioned to whole gland treatment. Now, um, I'll go through a little bit about the, um, about the consequences of whole gland treatment and the side effects, uh, because what we do know is, is that uh, really unequivocally that um, the functional outcomes, uh, especially in the short term, are better with uh, any focal therapy modality. And when we look at different treatment modalities, HIFU, cryo, photodynamic therapy, laser ablation, Really, the side effects and cancer and the oncologic outcomes fall within a pretty, uh, a pretty similar range. Um, um, but with, 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 regard, with regards to erectile function, uh, erectile dysfunction, and urinary leakage, uh, the vast majority of men will return to their ba baseline within 12 to 24 weeks. Um, and that's approximately 75% uh, of men. Um, another advantage is that patients can be retreated. So if they're ablated and there's persistent and there's consent for persistent or local, uh, local recurrence or persistent disease, really rather more so than local recurrence, um, they can be re-ablated either with the same or a different energy modality. Um, and they can receive definitive treatment. Now, this could be potentially more challenging. There may be a, a greater degree of uh, side effects. If, for example, with surgery, if uh, uh, there may be scar tissue, um, however, some small series that have been reported out of, uh, out of the UK and out of Canada have actually shown uh, continence, continence outcomes that are uh, approximately 85 to 93 percent to a dry by, by 12 months. So pretty good continence outcomes, comparable continence outcomes, um, and uh, comparable sexual function outcomes as well, with very limited increased morbidity. Uh, with radiotherapy, there's less evidence in the literature that's available. Um, however, there have been some anecdotal reports of, of an increase in urethral complications, specifically urethral necrosis. So, what are the disadvantages of focal therapy? And these are big. This, the the, the long-term the long-term outcomes are really unknown. Um, the short-term cancer control could be considered less than uh, surgery or radiation, and uh, it is, but also when I say could be, if we consider uh, biopsy-related outcomes of uh, 20 to 30% persistent disease, that's pretty consistent with what we see um, with positive surgical margins for T2 disease in radical prostatectomy. Those surgical margins uh, can be 20 to 30%, and if there is pathologic T3 disease or i.e. extra capsule extension or seminal vesicle invasion, positive margin rates can uh, approach 50%. Um, so the question is, is that, is that relevant? Um, uh, it's not always relevant with respect to surgery. We don't know that answer with respect to um, uh, ablation. Now, when I talk about cost, there are a number of different metrics that factor into cost. Uh, specifically, that's going to be uh, patient out-of-pocket cost. Um, the cost of surveillance, the cost of repeat treatment, and the cost of interventions in terms of quality of life. Now, we don't know what the answer to that question is, but certainly, currently, the out-of-pocket cost for some of these uh, focal ablations, uh, as they're not covered by insurance, um, can be high, especially if they're not uh, covered also under the auspices of a clinic. So what are the principles of treatment for focal therapy? So first is the modality of treatment. And what I mean by that is what energy uh, source you use. Um, and I don't think that there's necessarily uh, one ultimate best source, um, I, uh, source of energy. I, ultimately, you need to choose different um, energy modalities that are optimized towards uh, the cancer and, and really the location of the cancer. And I'll go through uh, where I think that can be best. Um, it needs to be done under image guidance. Uh, you need to select your template of ablation and your margin. So if we look at what are the different templates of ablation, uh, there's hemi-ablation, there's a quadrant ablation, um, 
contemporary focal ablation, unless it's within a very large prostate, is very similar to a quadrant ablation. Um, and then you have an extended dog-like ablation, which can be the anterior or posterior. There aren't a huge amount of uh, institutions that perform the dog leg approach, only because, again, uh, the more of the prostate that you treat, uh, the less uh, benefit you're going to receive in terms of functional outcomes. So how do we follow these men post-treatment? Uh, imaging, again, is going to be the cornerstone. We need to understand what PSA does. Now, uh, PSA is a, a difficult metric to, to use post-ablation. Now, it's important in that uh, it gives us some information. However, the degree of decline of PSA is going to be determined by how much of the prostate that you treat, uh, and also what is the relative PSA produced by the tumor versus the normal prostate. And so oftentimes, we use a greater than 50% decline as a surrogate. Um, however, there has been um, some recent data that's been, uh, um, that's been published by um, Prof. Ahmed and the UK group, which have demonstrated um, some uh, PSA metrics that we can be attuned to to identify local recurrence. Um, biopsy is something that uh, is more a stateside problem. The UK uh, and a lot of Europe feel that four-cause uh, biopsy is sufficient. Uh, however, um, currently, at least in my practice and a lot of the practices within the US, uh, we tend to biopsy these men post-ablation to confirm that we have complete, a treatment, a complete treatment of the ablation zone. Uh, and the surrounding uh, margin. And then of course, uh, it's really important to have a consistent functional assessment, um, especially in the context of a clinical trial or a prospective registry. And that's to, to, to evaluate both uh, um, um, urinary and sexual function outcomes. So how do we do this? So with imaging, it's uh, generally at six months post ablation and then annually. Um, for PSA, it's every three months for the first year, and then uh, uh, every six months as per essentially an active surveillance protocol. Uh, biopsy is at six months and then as per an active surveillance protocol with, um, with uh, uh, repeat biopsies as required or if there's triggers uh, based on imaging or rising PSA. Um, and then also uh, we do a functional assessment using EPIC, IPSS, IPSS and SHIM. Uh, however, um, really any reasonably valid, uh, reasonable and validated uh, questionnaire would be sufficient. We do it at baseline 3, 6, 12, and 24 months. So what are the different energy modalities that are available? So for cryotherapy, we have, I'm um, sorry, for, for those treatments that are, are, are more part more widely uh, commercially available. Um, these would include uh, cryo and HIFU, and those are the ones that we have um, uh, available at U of M. Um, but there's also a reversible erectroporation, there's radio, uh, um, focal SBRT, focal brachy, focal HDR brachy, uh, photodynamic therapy, um, uh, LIT, which is um, just focal laser ablation using block heating, uh, and transurethral HIFU uh, using the, the uh, Tulsa Pro device. So which modality do you use and where do you use it? In the anterior gland, um, you use technologies that have a, a less of an ability to be shaped, um, and that would be cryo, laser ablation, uh, IRE, PDT. Uh, HIFU is not going to be as good, especially in large gland where the focal zone cannot actually reach the most anterior portion of the prostate. Also, you'll tend to get less energy deposition anteriorly um, because as the energy goes from, from the rectum to the anterior prostate, it's, the energy is going to be attenuated by anything in between that, in, in between the focal zone and the, and the transducer, and that's generally uh, the posterior prostate. But posteriorly, HIFU gives you the greatest degree of precision, um, but you can also use uh, IRE, PDT, and even other uh, modalities uh, uh, are quite feasible uh, posteriorly. Um, however, it sometimes uh, the more experience that you get, the more comfortable that you are with uh, uh, treating more complex lesions that are closer to vital structures. Um, it has been proposed that, that radiotherapy uh, could be uh, um, the uh, uh, optimal approach at the apex, and the reason for that is dosimetry is a science. Uh, there's, there's textbooks on dosimetry, and there's a good understanding of being able to where you place your treatment in your margins, and, and certainly it could have a, it could have a great potential in other areas of the gland as well. 
So what are some of the newer focal therapy energy modalities coming into the space? Uh, gold nanoparticle photothermal laser ablation. Again, that's something that we offer, and I'll talk a little bit about, about our experience. There's the Nanotherm device, which is a clinical trial that's uh, out of the University of Washington and UT, uh, and, um, uh, UT San Antonio. Um, there are some other, none of, the, there are a number of other novel nanoparticle therapies, some that can be used in conjunction with HIFU or other uh, light. Um, there is bipolar radio frequency ablation. There is uh, Revive, which is um, similar to the Resume technology, but uh, specifically for prostate cancer that's coming down the pop pipeline. Uh, there's topsilicin, which is cleaved by PSA to cause uh, um, an, active, uh, uh, an active molecule that can destroy tissue. Um, and also there's the potential for theranostics, both uh, PSMA-based uh, uh, therapies. And again, these are in their very early stages. Uh, it's exciting to see where the field is going. So what is HIFU? It was approved in, in late 2015. And as I mentioned before, um, it was specifically approved for uh, prostate tissue ablation, not prostate cancer ablation, but prostate tissue ablation. That's an extremely uh, important distinction that we need to understand, and especially when we're counseling patients. Um, it does allow the precise delivery of ultrasound waves to destroy tissue. And really, this is done by a, a thermal effect, which causes immediate rise, and it causes these, uh, creates these elliptical um, or flame-shaped ablation zones, kind of like a grain of rice, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Um, it, uh, the Temperatures that it reaches uh, allows for almost immediate uh, 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 tissue destruction. And also there's a mechanical effect, uh, which is the generation um, of gas bubbles, which causes cavitation. So I, this was one of the, uh, as we go into some of the outcomes of the data, this is one of the most, uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, studies that were presented and generated a lot of uh, discussion specifically because of Dr. Walsh's um, response to it. But uh, what it did show was that there was 42 men, predominantly those who had intermediate risk or lower. Um, they had no prior ADT or prostate cancer treatment and they were selected with both multi-parametric MRI and transperineal mapping biopsy. They had an MRI post-procedure and then they were guided by biopsy of the treated area at six months. When we look at the outcomes of these men, I'll specifically highlight um, the purple dot, and the purple dot is the trifecta. Trifecta meaning um, being pad-free uh, pad uh, pad continents, um, erection sufficient for penetration, and no evidence of, uh, no evidence of cancer. And that was achieved in about 84% of uh, men at 12 months. So really not showing much other than a promising treatment modality. So there have been some systematic reviews that were done, this part done by Dr. Jim Hugh and his team. Um, and really, when we look at it, it's pretty hard to, you can't really group together the studies. What we see is that there's variable definitions in terms of oncologic outcomes. Um, and because of that, you see um, really wide variation in terms of clinically significant prostate cancer and biopsy versus not. Again, in terms of functional outcomes, the same problems that we've had with radical prostatectomy. Different definitions of continents. Sometimes it's uh, social continents of one pad. Sometimes it's pad-free, leak-free. Uh, ED again, variable definitions, and so you see these wide ranges. And the complications: the vast majority have uh, it's, it's very well tolerated, and what has historically been thought to be a, a terrible complication with the uh, fistula is really actually pretty low. Um, the Cases came predominantly from salvage cases, um, from whole gland treatments, and there's been a lot learned um, from this continuous experience over the last uh, 10, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and now really the risk of fistula is extremely, extremely low, less than 1%. So one of the large studies that were recently reported were five-year outcomes of focal therapy. Um, these were prospective uh, outcomes out of the UK. The vast majority of data has come out of Europe. Um, 625 cases performed between 2006 and 2015, a median follow-up of almost five years. Now, it's really also important to understand what the terminology is and what the endpoints are. Failure-free failure survival was defined as transition to radical or systemic treatment, so conversion to radical prospectomy, radiation therapy, or systemic therapy. Uh, development of metastasis or uh, cancer-specific mortality. So in the context of that, if we look here, 
Um, I've just highlighted here that really that there was a large proportion of men who were treated with intermediate uh, and high-risk prostate cancers. So about 85% of the men uh, were treated with intermediate or clinically significant prostate cancer. These were not reserved to low-risk patients. So what were the oncologic outcomes? Eight men required salvage uh, radical prostatectomy. Um, 36 under, underwent salvage external beam radiation. 10%, 10 patients uh, developed metastasis. Uh, about 20% of men did require a repeat, uh, repeat treatment. Um, and this was again uh, for cause. Uh, complications included urinary tract infection in approximately 9%. Um, endoscopic interventions for lower urinary tract symptoms, such as, um, such as urethral sloughing. Uh, bladder neck contracture was at, uh, was at approximately 10%. Um, and there was a very low fistula rate, fistula rate, like I mentioned before. What I will say is that there is a learning curve uh, to treatment um, and there have been modifications to the technique which have actually uh, demonstrated improvement in some of these, um, especially for endoscopic uh, interventions for LUTs, which have, uh, which have uh, improved, such as urethral sparing uh, in, a number of, uh, in a number of men. What were the functional outcomes? So 97 to 98% were pad-free. Uh, really 100% used required one pad or less. So from a continence perspective, excellent. Now, when we look at um, medium-term oncologic outcomes, this is uh, either focal or hemiablation with HIFU specifically. This is two centers in the UK. This is uh, University College London and uh, Princess Grace Hospital. Uh, 1,000 patients with a median follow-up of three years. Uh, again, the vast majority of these patients were treated with clinically significant prostate cancer, at least in grade group two or above. Biopsy failure, so there's, there was a little bit more granularity in terms of uh, failure. So we have biopsy failure-free survival, but again, these biopsy, biopsies are only performed for cause. There is retreatment-free survival, so that's um, those men who require a repeat ablation. Uh, and then there's also treatment-free, radical treatment-free survival, um, which you can see here. And um, if we look at bi biopsy-free uh, biopsy for su survival at, uh, at, at 10 years is about 50%. However, uh, only 20% of men uh, at, at eight years required uh, radical treatment. So there certainly is the ability to delay definitive treatment in a number of men. So if we look specifically at focal cryotherapy, um, five centers again, predominantly out of the UK, uh, median follow-up of 28.7 uh, months, uh, large proportion of predominantly uh, intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer. Failure-free survival at 36 months was 90.5%. Three, develop, three did develop metastatic disease, disease. Again, very low or zero uh, urinary incontinence and excellent um, erectile function outcomes. Now, if we compare erectile function outcomes to um, the PROTECT trial, if we look at, uh, at six years, if we look at radical prostatectomy, only about 17% of men had uh, erection sufficient for penetration. If we look at radiotherapy, only 27% of men had erections for sufficient for penetration. Even in men who have followed on active surveillance on PROTECT, um, only about 30% of men at six years uh, had erection sufficient for penetration. So even if you just perform active monitoring rather than active surveillance, um, you do, you will see a decline in erectile function. Um, with regards to bowel-related symptoms in the PROTECT trial, um, the small differences, but uh, uh, real differences in terms of bloody stools and uh, diarrhea, um, uh, bloody and loose stools, um, but these really did not exist for active monitoring and, uh, and um, radical prostatectomy. And similarly, the, the likelihood of seeing any bowel-related symptoms for uh, focal ablation is extremely, extremely low. So now I'll transition to um, a clinical trial that's ongoing, just to show uh, a little bit about what's going on in this space. Uh, this is a phase two clinical trial um, for uh, MRI ultrasound uh, guided focal laser ablation, but it's nanoparticle directed photothermal laser ablation as opposed to conventional um, laser interstitial thermal therapy, and I will review exactly uh, what the differences are shortly. We have completed accrual of the first phase of the trial, which is approximately 45 men, and we have extended it um, to include the an additional 55 men. So how does it work? Um, the proprietary um, part of this is the oroshell, which are nanoshells, and I'll describe what those are shortly. 
Um, they infuse and circulate freely in the bloodstream, and this is performed. This is given approximately 24 hours prior to ablation, or within 24 hours to uh, uh, within 24 hours of ablation. Um, they select selectively and passively accumulate in the tumor perivascular space, um, and what that means is that they harness the um, aberrant endothelium of neovascularization of tumors, um, and they extravasate into the extravascular space. Um, we use near end of infrared light, which lights up the uh, the, the tumor and nanoparticles within that space absorb that light, convert it into heat, and generate the thermal ablation. So, what are what are the nanoparticles? There are non-conducting silicon core. These are covered by a gold nanoshell, and the thickness of that shell is tuned to a specific wavelength of light that we use. Um, and again, within the near infrared spectrum, um, and then the uh, peg blocking layer, so it's not immediately. Um, processed by the uh, by our um, immune system, and the total size is about 150 nanometers. So if we look at it relative to the size of a red blood cell, it's quite tiny. So this is cleared. Eventually, they are cleared by the reticular endothelial system, and they don't get excreted. Uh, but what happens is is that they go through the these aberrant vessels, as you saw there, extravasate in the perivascular space. What we then do is use a um, near infrared laser uh, to, to, penetrate, to penetrate the tissue. Um, as it illuminates the tissue, we start to see that they absorb this energy or this light and they convert it into heat and causes a thermal ablation. So just to, as an illustr for illustrative purposes here to look at the difference between normal endothelium and also this fenestrated uh, abnormal um, tumor endothelium. Essentially, we're harnessing the, the, um, this uh, aberrant endothelium. So what's the difference between photothermal ablation and laser interstitial thermal therapy or conventional uh, laser ablation? We use, because we aren't using bulk heating, but rather we're, we're heating up the nanoparticles, uh, we don't have to use high energy uh, that we see with conventional laser ablation. We usually use a power of 9 to 15 watts with uh, full, uh, F conventional FLA. But with nanoparticle, we can actually use a, an energy of between 5 to 5.5 watts or 5 to 6 watts. Um, in the absence of nanoparticles, it's subablative. If you put it anywhere else and there's no nanoparticles, um, it's not going to cause any uh, generation of heat or cell death. Uh, but in the presence of nanoparticles, it will um, heat up to very high temperatures. Now, we use ultrasound for optical fiber placement. Conventionally, focal laser ablation has been done in bore, uh, but this is changing. There are clinical trials that are being done uh, at UCLA uh, by Dr. Letty Mark, Shamnath Rajan, um, at the NIH with Dr. Brad Wood and Dr. Peter Pinto, which are uh, looking at uh, fusion-guided uh, focal laser ablation. Um, theoretically, the ablation zone should conform to the tumor. Essentially, if I put an applicator somewhere else within the prostate, if there's no cancer there, there are no nanoparticles there, um, and it shouldn't cause uh, a thermal ablation. However, what we do know from our experience and from prior um, uh, in vitro and um, uh, uh, trials is that the BPH nodules can have an increased deposition of nanoparticles. Not always, but some of them can have aberrant neovasculature. Um, and so, uh, Yes, it does conform to the tumor predominantly. Uh, however, within the transition zone, you can start to see uh, bulk heating. Um, it yields a photo photothermal coagulation rather than thermal fixation. And that means rather than just bulk heating, uh, it's using the light uh, to convert it into heat and cause ablation. So not to spend too much time on this, but we uh, administer a nanoparticle infusion. This is a, a weight-based infusion. Uh, these nanoparticles are actually, the preparation is dark blue. Um, and they can go to any place where there's neovascularization. So if you have a cut uh, or if you have some other prior area that's healing, um, you can actually have blue spots. Um, I've heard of some, there was a patient on the trial who was a trumpet player, uh, so they had a very vascular tongue and did have a blue tongue for a period of time. And these generally go away. Um, we have a laser setup. Uh, we have a coolant supply, which uh, is essentially a sheath around the laser fiber that runs water uh, to cool the laser fiber to ensure that there is no um, charring. Um, and uh, we test the laser power, and you can see the laser catheter assembly there. Um, we have uh, diff different um, diffusers. We have an 18 millimeter and a 10 millimeter uh, diffuser that can generate different ab ablation zones, um, and these are done under transperineal fusion guidance. 
So this is one of our first patients, or this I believe is actually is our first patient that uh, we treated at the University of Michigan on trial. Um, here you can see this anterior, uh, uh, anterior medial tumor, but just off the midline, you can see that there is some increased perfusion on DCE. It, the pathology showed us target-only Gleason 3, Gleason Day Group 2 prostate cancer. 12 core was negative. This is the type of treatment planning we do. Here we do it within the Dynacad software, so you see the true lesion and a margin. Um, this is actually a smaller margin than, what we, than what, what we use now. Now we use approximately a one centimeter margin, and here this is an approximately five millimeter margin. So because this was the first day that we'd ever done this treatment, um, we needed the transperineal grids, and I didn't realize that. Uh, the patient had already received the infusion, and uh, we didn't have any of those grids within our, within our surgery center. So I actually had to start calling around frantically to cryotherapy vendors, uh, 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 different practices, and saying, do you have this grid? Uh, most said no. I was able to get Civco to promise to overnight it to us the following day. Uh, I would just stand outside the surgery center waiting. This was actually the Amazon Prime van and not the, uh, not the delivery. Eventually, um, our, uh, the UPS delivery lady showed up and she saved the day, uh, though we were about an hour, hour and a half late. So this is what we do during treatment. So you can see the setup here. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Euronav, it's an electromagnetically uh, uh, tracked uh, fusion guidance system. Uh, that box you see is an uh, electromagnetic field generator, um, which detects the sensors on the grid and the probe to know uh, where the prostate is after it's co-registered. Uh, this is actually Lauren Corona, who is one of our res who is one of our residents, uh, placing the transperineal um, uh, trocars. And then once we pre-place all the trocars, uh, then we treat each uh, treat each individual tract with a laser ablation. Um, so one of the anxiety inducing aspects of this procedure is, is that you oftentimes don't get any real-time feedback. You really have to trust that the treatment is happening um, because unless it reaches these really, really high temperatures where you may see some uh, um, hyperechoic areas forming, uh, in general, you don't necessarily see a lot of uh, treatment effect. Um, so you have to wait until the 48 to 72 hour post-treatment MRI to see if you actually treated anything that you intended to ablate. So here you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is a T2-weighted imaging, and you can't really see. You can see there's a dark spot um, anteriorly where the lesion was, but you don't really get a sense for the true volume of ablation. How we determine this is based on the post-contrast imaging, and here you can see, see on the delayed images uh, that there is no perfusion within that space. Now, as part of this, uh, as part of this trial, we do treat uh, at the contralateral side with a control ablation. Here you can see within the transition zone, the prior tract of the, of the laser ablation, and you can see that there is no uh, heating or thermal ablation uh, within that uh, control tract. So um, some evidence support, support that there is a, a, a tumor-specific um, uh, ablation uh, with this technology. So, so far we've had 45 patients and enrolled, 45 were treated. Um, uh, at three months, there's no cancer on biopsy. It's uh, in approximately 67% of patients or two-thirds of patients. Um, if we use the Delphi consensus criteria, which is um, no pattern four or no cancer greater than three millimeters uh, of Gleason 6, uh, that's a 77.8%. Uh, 12 months, no cancer uh, in 72% of patients um, for those who have reached that 12-month follow-up. So very encouraging results. Um, you know, really, this is the, we're able to do this because we have a, a really um, impressive team of uh, team of people. On the left is uh, um, uh, is John Schwartz, who's a PhD scientist with uh, Nanospectra Biosciences. He's there for every procedure and helps us uh, helps us as we go through. And this is our spectacular team at the Livonia Surgery Center. Um, okay, so in summary, we have a, a, there really is a huge potential role for localized prostate cancer. Uh, maybe not unequivocally, but I would say pretty close to unequivocally, we have superior uh, short-term functional outcomes. Um, it needs to be offered in the context of a clinical trial or prospective registry. There are a tremendous number of unknowns. Um, 
ideal patient and how we select these patients. Certainly we know that imaging is important, but we don't understand other uh, bio, both uh, serum-based biomarkers or tissue-based biomarkers, which will be able to help us um, with patient selection. The long-term oncologic outcomes are unknown. Um, the optimal follow-up, whether we do biopsy as part of uh, uh, um, as part of surveillance or whether it's for cause, uh, is not is not well known. Um, and also, outcomes of salvage are only really reported in some small series, even though we know that it is feasible. And in post radical uh, post radical process, salvage prostatectomy, uh, they have a, a decent and acceptable uh, functional outcomes. Um, and really, we require a healthy, un healthy skepticism to be able to do this. And uh, I distinguish that from an unhealthy skepticism where we say, you know, this, this has absolutely no role. I just think that's the wrong attitude to have with any novel therapy. So is this the hill that I'm going to die on? It is not. This is the, this is the screenshot. Um, this is the, uh, the, the screenshot uh, uh, slide um, where I strongly believe that focal therapy is in the future, focal therapies in the future, 10, 20 years from now, either somebody will be showing this slide and saying I'm a genius or saying I'm an idiot. Um, so we do have a, a just a, a short uh, shameless plug for a, a course that we're holding. We held it previously in Miami. Uh, it's a, a, a two-day course on focal therapy and uh, um, and this year we'll be including ablative BPH approaches. Um, this is hosted by myself and Dr. Abhinav, Abhinav Sadhana at the University of Cincinnati. Um, has, we'll have really some superb faculty there, including Hashim Ahmed, Mark Emberton, uh, Samir Taneja, Dr. Indy Gill, Andre Abreu, just a, a huge amount of excellent, uh, uh, excellent faculty there. Now, what I'll leave you with is, is that uh, a, a small excerpt. This was uh, by Hugh Hampton Young. For those of, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, he was the youngest chair of urology ever, um, specifically at the uh, at Johns Hopkins. In 1897, he was appointed at the year at the age of 27 years old, um, and he wrote this in 1937, about three years prior to his death. He said that we have shown that in early cases, a hemiprostatectomy may, may be sufficiently radical. The removal of that half of the prostate in which the car carcinomatous nodule lies, along with its capsule and the seminal vesicle and vas deferens may be entirely sufficient. So the concept is not new. Um, and we have a number of new technologies that can allow this to be less invasive and potentially offer an acceptable oncological outcome with an improved functional outcome. So I'd like to thank, um, uh, thank uh, Dr. Hepson and the UCSF team for helping uh, coordinate and putting this together. Uh, it was a real pleasure um, giving you my thoughts on focal therapy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. That was a great, great lecture. Uh, we have lots of great questions here, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the Q&A. Um, so first, prior to treatment, um, uh, some people wanted to know if you could describe specific MRI characteristics that you uh, look for when uh, considering if a patient is amenable for th focal therapy, such as size of the prostate, size of the lesion, EC. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so with regards to cryotherapy, um, you, you know, size of the prostate is not really a concern or consideration. Um, with HIFU, it has to be somewhere between 35 and 40 grams. Uh, the reason is, is that beyond that, uh, it's difficult for the prostate beam to reach, be uh, sorry, the HIFU beam to reach beyond that. Um, and some sites, they will, they can debulk it by doing a uh, hole up or do, if it's a, if it's a peripheral zone lesion or doing um, a TORP to be able to get it if it's on the borderline to get it within the uh, achievable size. Um, but that's generally the size restrictions for, uh, for high food. Um, in terms of MRI features, really beyond your standard uh, features, it just needs to be visible. The things that would be exclusionary would be gross extra capsular extension. Um, the, the, the negative predictive or the positive predictive value for bulge is very, very low. Um, especially if I'm planning on doing a cryoablation, um, uh, the, the ability, the visibility of a bulge there does not really sway me that much. Um, however, if there's gross extracapsular extension, I would exclude that patient. Um, the other thing is tumor contact length. So what we do know is, is that uh, tumors that have a much larger capsular contact 
um, really greater than 10 or 11 millimeters, uh, the likelihood of uh, extra capsular extension is going to be much higher. And those patients, I would exclude them um, from focal therapy. They are likely going to be best served with uh, definitive treatment. Now, it is really important to be super, super selective uh, with these patients. I don't think oftentimes the size of a lesion is, um, is that important because you can always do a hemiablation. With cryo, you can grow the ice ball with more probes or to whatever size that you feel needs to cover the entirety of the gland. As long as you can achieve an appropriate margin, the size of the tumor, um, at least for what we know now, is not really relevant. Okay, and similarly, patients that come uh, to your clinic uh, with uh, lower urinary tract symptoms um, pre-treatment, how do you counsel them? Yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. So uh, the vast majority of series that have reported on lower urinary tract symptoms have actually noticed uh, an improvement overall, a statistically significant improvement overall uh, in IPSS scores, for example, um, in follow-up. Now, what I do counsel them is, is that those symptoms are going to be worse uh, before they get better. Um, it also depends on how much of the prostate that you're, going to, uh, that you're going to treat, but most men will actually overall achieve uh, an improvement in their lower urinary tract symptoms. In the first six to eight weeks, I say up to 12 weeks, they'll have an increase in irritated voiding symptoms, urinary frequency, urgency, um, dysuria. Uh, it usually settles out relatively quickly though. Um, and I usually keep a catheter in for about three to five days, again, depending on the initial size of the gland um, mm -hmm. and also um, the, um, the volume of tissue that's being ablated. Okay, and along along those lines, um, if a patient is undergoing a TERP prior to procedure, um, how how much time beforehand can you do it the same day as uh, the focal therapy? Um, it really depends on the degree of contraction that's required. Um, I generally will not TUR patients before uh, uh, ablation. I feel like you start to lose some of the benefits in terms of retrograde ejaculation and other things. Um, so usually. Um, I won't personally do that in my practice. I'll just offer them definitive treatment. Um, now, in those that do do it, the larger amount of contraction that you require, remember with a TRP, you're only going to achieve uh, about 40 to 50% um, gland size reduction in the best of circumstances, even with an aggressive TUR. Um, and I would, I would recommend the greater uh, amount of volume that you need to, that you need, that you need to decrease by, I would give about a four to six week interval uh, for contraction of the prostate to happen. Um, if you're just five to 10 cc's off oftentimes, or if you're doing it predominantly, uh, just to eliminate some of the um, uh, urethral sloughing or bladder neck contracture, a risk of bladder neck contracture, which, uh, with, which there are some people who, who, who perform it for that reason, then it can be done within the same setting. Sorry, I'm on mute. How many patients uh, 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 get urinary retention after after focal therapy? Um, so I will tell you that when we started the clinical trial, approximately 30% of men um, underwent uh, were, were had urinary retention. And this is because these men were discharged without a catheter. Uh, they voided in the recovery room before uh, going home. Uh, and even then, there was about a 30% uh, 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 rate of urinary retention. When you leave the catheter in for about three to five days, that risk is about 10%. Um, it's hard to predict, but it's generally in those who have a much larger, pro larger prostate. I would say that those who have much larger ablation have a much greater degree of edema within the prostate, um, and that can persist a little, a little bit longer. That's another reason why if you do a TUR, you can kind of prevent that. But in my, in my personal uh, view, I don't think it's a good reason to do a TUR. And, um... Once the catheter is removed in the patient, if the patient is retaining still, how do you, how do you manage those patients? Um, I replace the catheter. That has happened in maybe one or two men that I've, uh, that I've done. Again, these are very large prostates uh, with a large ablation zone. Um, they, I, I've never had a, a patient who has not been able to void afterwards. Okay. Usually another three to five days and they're able to void or teach them um, intermittent self-cath until they're able to void spontaneously. Um, and then someone uh, wanted to know if you've changed, uh, why you've changed your margin goals um, and what the basis is for the one centimeter margin. Yeah, so there's a, a couple of reasons. One is, is that your MRI, there's recent evidence to suggest that your MRI under, underestimates your uh, true cancer volume by approximately 30%. That's one thing. 
And the second thing is that the best estimate for tumor volume is going to be your DCE sequence. Conventionally, when we do our treatment planning or biopsy planning, for example, it's done on a T2-weighted imaging. And this is the sequence that actually gives us the, the lowest uh, volume threshold for the tumor. So, um, so because you can only you know, plan off based on what you see, you also have to be able to account for registration error. Registration error, depending on the system that you use in your experience, can be anywhere from uh, two to three millimeters. Uh, and so if you take that into account, plus um, uh, you have, if, if you're in, a, in an area which is very safe to treat, there's really no reason why you can't uh, expand your margin. Um, and then the, the final reason is that the vast majority of failures are at the margin of the ablation. Um, usually within the center of the area that you treat, that area is dead. Uh, the areas where you start to see persistent disease or quote unquote local recurrence, those are at the periphery of the tumor. And so a wider margin um, uh, is better to help uh, uh, protect against that. Okay. Um, and someone wanted to know if you could comment on the use of urethral warming catheters uh, for cryotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so the, the goal of a urethral warming catheter is is not to actually preserve the urethra, it's specifically to preserve the sphincter. So the, again, the urethra warming catheter is there in place not to preserve the urethra, but to preserve the sphincter. For any focal ablation that you use, you can, as long as you're not completely obliterating the entirety of the urethral, mu urethral mucosa, uh, these men tend to um, heal very well uh, with a low likelihood of stricture. So in periurethral tumors, it is something to be it is something to factor into consideration if you're doing cryo, uh, because you may not be able to achieve uh, the deep freeze that you need uh, close to the urethra. So in those cases, as long as you're away from the sphincter, if you have a thermocouple which is measuring the uh, external sphincter, you can actually clamp the warming catheter to allow it to uh, achieve uh, a freeze into the uh, into the urethra. The temperature that you want to achieve is about minus 20. Minus 20 degrees, or ideally minus 40, but minus 20 um, is with it is uh, five millimeters inside the edge of the ice pole. The edge of the ice pole is zero degrees Celsius. Zero degrees Celsius is uh, non-lethal. Minus 20 is irreversible cell death. Minus 40 degrees is instant cell death. Mm, okay. Um, and then someone wanted to ask if uh, you think there's any uh, role for focal radiation therapy, such as SBRT, and and if so, how how does it compare to um, other focal therapies? That's a great question. I think that I think that focal radiotherapy is really underutilized. Like I mentioned before, that dosimetry is an exact. I mean, it's a it's a it's a well studied science in the world of radiotherapy, and I don't think we're harnessing it well enough. Now, I think that. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. I think that some um, some radiotherapists may not believe in the concept of radiotherapy, uh, of focal radiotherapy. May, they, they may think that uh, the degree of benefit that you that you gain from treating uh, less versus the entire gland may not be sufficient um, in terms of uh, the trade-off in oncologic outcomes. But there are a number of centers um, that are performing either focal HDR breaky, focal low dose rate breaky, or focal SBRT. I know that there is a um, there is a trial at uh, UAB. Um, there is um, uh, there is also uh, HDR trials. Um, I can't remember the exact institution, but there are both low dose rate and HDR break E trials as well. Uh, a lot of people want to know how you follow these patients uh, uh, after the procedure. Is PSA reliable? Um, how often do you check the PSA, and um, do you use the Phoenix criteria for chemical biochemical recurrence? Yeah, so the, the I, so that was what was initially proposed in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of criteria. Um, I'll go back to the slide which uh, shows the follow up in terms of how we follow these uh, how we follow these patients. Uh, Phoenix or Astro criteria, we used it because we didn't know really know any better, but it, it's not really relevant uh, in the context of focal therapy. Um, so we the the, the the bottom line is is we actually don't really know how to follow how, how to utilize PSA. It's not. Uh, extremely reliable, again, because it's dependent on the, de the de decrease in PSA is dependent on how much of the prostate you ablate and also the relative uh, amount of PSA produced by the tumor versus normal prostate. Um, what we do know is that we, we do want to kind of follow it from the, uh, the nadir. Um, there has been some data from, again, from the UK, which shows that a, a 
approximately a one point rise above the nadir is uh, is is associated with local local recurrence. <laughs> Um, I think one last question. Um, can you comment on radical prostatectomy after focal therapy? Yeah, so there have been two series, or there's actually been three series that have been reported, uh, at least to my knowledge. One is uh, Paul Cathcart at uh, um, UCLH in London. Uh, the other is uh, Dr. Uh, Fleischner from Canada. Um, and also um, uh, Dr. Patel, Vip Patel has also reported a series. Dr. Vip Patel series included both focal patients and radiotherapy. Um, now I will say this in the context that all of these series are done by really, you know, not just expert, but super expert surgeons uh, with a high level of experience. Um, and they have actually really good functional outcomes, specifically regarding continence. Uh, rectal function is is poor with radical prostatectomy, even though we like to think that it's not, but the reality is it is. Uh, about 34, 30 to 40% of men um, have sufficient erectile function uh, in the primary setting uh, with uh, uh, at one to two years when we look at um, when we look at radical prostatectomy. With regards to continence in the Canadian series, it was approximately, I think around 93%. Uh, in the UK series, it was about 84% continence uh, at 12 months. So really good continence outcomes. Now, what I will say, how they have described it, I, again, I have only done um, I have done two or three post-laser ablation. Um, I've seen some more dense tissue where I was concerned that it's persistent cancer, but it's actually taken a bunch of margins that they will all be negative. It's just fibrosis, uh, but didn't really find it with a true focal laser ablation, not much different. However, in those who have a lot of experience, they say that um, uh, cryotherapy is the worst, uh, followed by HIFU because you can follow the, the area on the non-treated side and uh, identify your plane on the treated side. Uh, followed by radiotherapy being the least amount of tissue effect. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and stop here. That was a really great lecture. Thank you for answering all of our questions. Um, all the questions that weren't answered, we'll post them on our website. Just wanted to remind everybody to go fill out the survey, and we'll see you at the next lecture at 1010. Sure. Thanks very much.